So um, the class we're taking is a, it's a multicultural counseling class. There's about uh, 12 of us in it uh, at the moment. And uh, we're just trying to go through different cultures that we're not maybe familiar with in order to try and, I guess, more familiarize ourselves with it and maybe try and see from different perspectives any um, potential issues or maybe conflicts or biases that we may encounter in future clients mm. uh, and ourselves. Um, so I was wondering, do you, since you have mental health experience, do you have any advice on that? Great. Well, first of all, thank you for, you know, for doing something like this because it shows your interest in, in, you know, in trying to understand and bridge the gap. Cultural competency is really important and it is something um, that's critical for mental health providers to know about because in many cases it can prevent uh, care, right? If, if someone is, is, has predisposed ideas or, or biases, as you said, or just prejudices or, or just lacks understanding, they may not even feel comfortable to seek help. And so if we can somehow address those concerns, then we can hopefully encourage people to be more open to seeking out uh, services. So um, I, I want to applaud you for, for, for doing something like this. As um, far as, yeah, some of the barriers to, uh, for access of care that we've come across from our community, because it is something certainly uh, we've witnessed and we've had to grapple with in our community the in immense stigma with mental health. Um, there, it, when I started, for example, back in 2009, when we started our website, Mental Health for Muslims, uh, I started with my cousin who's a clinical psychologist. And then I had a lot of experience in the community because there was such a stigma to seek professional help. They would seek out people like myself or other religious leaders in the community, assuming that whatever they were going with or through, whether it was their own personal struggles with anxiety, depression, things that we knew symptomatically had, you know, we, we already knew how to define those things, but because of their lack of knowledge of this, these were mental health issues, they assumed that they were spiritual crises. So that is for the Muslim community, a big issue where a lot of people self-diagnose and presume falsely that what they're presenting is a lack of spirituality. There's a disconnect there. So they sometimes are so turned off by the idea of actually seeking professional help, help because in their worldview, that's just not a possibility. It has to be a spiritual explanation for why I'm, I'm sad and depressed. Maybe I should pray more. Maybe my, maybe God is not happy with me. So they'll make all these deductions, which are of course, uh, most of the time, not there's no basis to them other than their own lack of awareness. So we found that that's a big challenge where a lot of times the stigma to mental health is that people associate you, that you have, you know, it's, it's uh, unfortunate, but there are a lot of uh, people who um, equate mental health issues with some intelligent deficiencies or other character quality deficiencies, not realizing that it's just the same as if you, you know, had a health problem. You wouldn't uh, presume anything about a person's character or their, you know, their their who they are if they had a health issue. But unfortunately, when it comes to mental health, that's the stigma, right? Like, oh, that that person is not well. They're crazy. God forbid. You know, they use these sort of terms that are really just um, uh, uh, not right at all. But that's the, that's the conclusion that's often made, that mental health means that someone's not right and, and they're almost irreparable. Um, so I don't want to associate myself with that at all. It has to be a spiritual issue that I can find a spiritual solution for. That's probably the biggest barrier that we've come across um, within our own community. But we have made some strides because since we started that website in 2009 where there are very few practitioners and these conversations even in the community weren't really open we have come like almost light years in the past you know how many years now has it been right 11 or so years i have seen in my own personal experience so many more um conferences events programs at the mosque every friday uh, you'll see family nights and programs where imams even and people who are typically, you know, who, who in the past may not have been too open about this topic. Now it's a very common thing where mental health issues are brought up as community-wide, uh, you know, program uh, that programming that, that is important for everybody to hear. So they'll put it, um, you know, sometimes even in the Friday sermon, they'll have uh, addresses that talk about domestic violence, substance abuse, uh, depression, anxiety, all of the very common disorders that we're seeing on the rise uh, as a people, as a species, right? They're, they're addressing those um, 
to the community. So we have made some, some really great strides. We've, all, we've also seen a huge surplus of more practitioners. There's more, um, there's something, I don't know if you're familiar with, but uh, you may have heard of it. There's the Khalil Center, which is probably the leading national now organization of, of counselors um, that have you know, offices all over the US and they're branching out, I think even into Canada where they are um, really taking the, the, the lead in the, in the discussions around mental health. There's, there, it's basically a service uh, center, but they have chapters throughout the US and they provide services, mental health services to the community. So there are organizations like that and, and many others that have come up within just, I would say the past 10 to 12 years, it's been really incredible to witness. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like there's, it's really growing the support. Um, mm -hmm. So being hopefully new uh, therapists or counselors, what could we do to help try and also bridge that gap so they feel accepted or um, they're able to receive help? That's a great question. Again, I thank you for asking that question. I think there should be some sort of cultural competency training about Islam and Muslims first before someone even uh, considers taking on Muslim clients because the issues that do come up oftentimes are so in, enmeshed with their spiritual identity as or their religious identity as Muslims. So it's very hard to divorce those things in, in a therapy session. If And that's also one of the barriers that we found is that people are reluctant to go to see non-Muslims because they think they're not going to understand what I'm going through or why this particular incident is affecting me the way they are, as opposed to a Muslim who at least has that context. They understand Right. So I think when you have just a, a very simple, like, you know, primary, uh, you know, refresher about Islam to know the, the, the beliefs, what the beliefs are, what the um, the daily, uh, you know, life of a Muslim entails will give, I think, the provider a really better lens to understand why certain things uh, may affect their client uh, the, that, that maybe is not um, understood uh, by, by it, or seen in other uh, people of, of different faiths and backgrounds. Because for Muslims, Islam is not just a religious identity that we uh, ascribe to on certain days or around holidays, or, you know, we just kind of, it's a label or the, something that we, it's actually a lifestyle. So Islam very much affects everything that we do, all the choices that we make, our worldview. So if you don't have that understanding, then um, it might be difficult for you to understand why someone, um, you know, won't take your uh, guidance on, well, have you tried this or have you tried that? Because in their uh, particular worldview, that's just not an option. Like for example, divorce, you know, I, I, as someone who's been doing spiritual counseling for a long time, for Muslims, keeping the marriage intact is so important. And it's, we take marriage very, very seriously. Divorce is permissible in the event that the marriage is just not salvageable, but you really do try your best to, to save the relationship, especially when children are in the mix. So that is such an essential um, you know, uh, belief that, that is very rooted in, 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 in many uh, Muslims and in, in their, in their just values. So if you have a practitioner who doesn't have that same understanding and they will on the very first you know, session uh, suggest that maybe you should just dissolve the relationship. You know, if there's a, it's like a counseling session, for example, you guys just don't seem very compatible. You fight a lot. There's too many other variables, you know, finances, in-laws. And so if they just deduce quickly that maybe the marriage has just run out of, you know, like there's really no point because in the Western or the, you know, their context, it just seems like that's the most practical thing to do. Then the client will likely feel like, okay, see, they're just quick to rush us to divorce. They don't really care about trying to really help us. And that is actually a very common complaint I've heard from Muslim clients who have gone to see non-Muslims. They always come back saying, no, they're too liberal minded, or they don't have the same family values, same understanding of like, even uh, in-laws, you know, a big issue that you'll find if you ever are to uh, have clients in the Muslim community are the families are very um, enmeshed in Muslim marriages. So it's not so simple to tell, or it's not easy to tell your client, well, you should just create boundaries with your mother-in-law and tell her not to come over, you know, those kind of things in, in our Western sensibilities, they make sense because it's like boundaries are very clear for us and we're more empowered to have that sort of those lines, you know, really clear. But for Muslims, it's very difficult because 
it will absolutely impact um, the entire marriage. You know, if you were to draw such clear lines with your mother-in-law or your father-in-law, it could potentially lead to a divorce. It's, it's that serious, right? So I think having that knowledge that there's certain values that, you know, people of Muslim, you know, background or whether, what, regardless of the culture, it's pretty shared because of their faith that they adhere to strictly. Therefore, I have to kind of adjust my tone or my approach to not just, you know, uh, dismiss those things or to overlook those things in my, um, in my, in what I provide and the service that I provide. So, yeah. You've been mentioning a lot about family, and uh, I know how important it is, but there's also, it seems like, um, almost a community-like family within the faith itself. Like, it's, it may be separate from, like, the, you know, the family family, but it still feels like they, tr that it's treated as kind of a larger family within the Absolutely. faith. Absolutely. That's a very, very on point. We do, the community is very, we do see ourselves um, as a one large body, although we're definitely not a monolith. There's a lot of variety, but we are, um, it's part of our belief system to see ourselves as one body. So we call, for example, the Muslim community at large is called the Ummah, which is like a nation of Muslims. And so there's a lot of um, you know, teachings in the faith that say that we do, we should really try to strengthen our brotherhood, our sisterhood. So if you're part of a larger community, wherever you live, yes, you see your community members as extended family members in many cases. And there, there is, of course we have, you know, there's, there's lines. I mean, it's not that they would know all of your private, uh, you know, information. We're not like that, but it's too, um, you do take into consideration the larger impact of your choices and decisions um, as an individual on the on the community as well. We're not so separate that we just don't care. Like for example, reputation is a very big uh, deal, you know, in in many of our Muslim cultures. Like so, a lot of people will take that into consideration. Like how is that, how is the community going to view me, you know, if I take this decision or if I take this decision? So sometimes those factors are also really important and why. Uh, they may choose to go one way or another. And if a provider isn't aware of that, and again, they give very Western ideas to uh, people who are not defined by those ideas, it may cause uh, just a lack of, you know, connection. And then you might not see that, that client again, because they just feel like, well, they don't get me. They don't get me. They're just giving me very Western perspectives um, about things. And I just, I don't agree with that. That's not my philosophy or that's not my viewpoint. So, but it, it can be, you know, bridged by just having more um, understanding and, and education about those things. Because I've, I've actually sent uh, friends of mine who, who uh, didn't have success or couldn't find Muslim therapists in their area. We've done some research and looked for people who in their, you know, description of their services, they actually do describe that they do have competency around certain cultures and they found great success. Like that person did their due diligence or their you know, they, they did their part to learn more about different cultures and it did help the way that they were able to s provide service. I think it's, it's so, um, it is possible to do that. Uh, yeah. So in your experience, uh, do you, when you're dealing with clients, do you incorporate the family a lot more or is it still kind of an isolated thing that you just kind of use it, use your knowledge and experience as a background? Um, that's a good question. I always do like to know, I mean, depends on the circumstance. I've worked with individuals. I've worked with, you know, actual families where the mother, the father, and the children are all kind of there and then couples. So I think it just dep depends on each uh, situation. But if I feel that there is some involvement, um, you know, meddlesome behavior, for example, in a, in a marital context, then yes, I will want to know the um, you know more specific details about the family and the, the relationship that the individuals have because you know there are some uh, filial piety for example in Islam is very important it's one of the top um, you know beliefs or tenets of the faith is that we worship God and we you know we have our own um, you know there's a lot of uh, ritualistic practice that we have but one of the most important things that a Muslim must do or should do is to show reverence and respect to their parents. So we, that's a very big part of the Muslim, uh, you know, mindset. So it's, you know, filial piety, just having that. So that can sometimes though pose, um, you know, issues when it comes to the marital relationship because a spouse may be completely conflicted if they have a very overbearing parent who is dictating to them, 
how they should be in their marriage and you know everything that they should be doing in their marriage because they don't have good boundaries then the the child or the the spouse may feel really torn because they feel that they're doing something spiritually wrong like if they go against their parents right so this is where someone like myself who has a spiritual background can actually give them a balanced view that you don't have to pick your your wife or your husband over your mom or dad right it doesn't have to be like that you can actually have compromise and maybe it's your mom or your dad that needs we need to bring them in and talk to them about hey listen you know we get that maybe you're having a really difficult time you know with your own personal situation or because you know a lot of our the older generation they get, um, they create some unhealthy codependency sometimes because being here in a foreign land, not having their family uh, from back home, they can create those codependencies with their children that be, that get very unhealthy and they're not aware of it. And so sometimes having a third person like myself or maybe a religious leader who can come in and tell the mom and dad, like, listen, yes, you have rights in Islam and your children should be dutiful and respectful to you, but you also have to respect their boundaries. And this is what that entails. So we can help to kind of, you know, dissipate the situation that way. Um, but there have certainly been instances where, yes, you have to involve the family if the relationship or the individual, because there's been individual cases as well, where the parents are just not understanding, um, you know, the conflict that their child has uh, individually, and they need more education on mental health issues, for example, like depression, anxiety, what does that mean? How can you better help them to, you know, help themselves instead of, uh, you know, just, um, you know, shaming or blaming or kind of getting into that negative space because you're frustrated with your child or you're frustrated with this individual. So sometimes it is necessary to get the family involved. Well, you also mentioned um, using the imam with the, uh, the parents mm -hmm. as well. Uh, is that something you would think would be, you know, acceptable in the mental health field to try and incorporate the spiritual leaders? I think it's absolutely something to keep as an option in the event that you're dealing with people who are very religiously committed people, because, you know, they sometimes have that tunnel vision or just, you know, they can't really see beyond uh, what, what you're telling them. So to have an ally who's in the community, um, a religious leader who you can outsource when needed, or to bring into a mediation, for example, or some conversation to help to, um, you know, again, dispel certain false ideas. Cause there are, there's, uh, there's a lot, there's sometimes just cultural things that get um, confused or passed on as religious ideas that an imam or, or even a female, you know, teacher could certainly uh, elucidate and clarify that, listen, that's a cultural idea. That's not religious, right? So if you are concerned about your spiritual well-being or doing the right thing, let me just tell you that that practice is nothing to do with Islam, and it's actually just you know from your culture. So sometimes it can be very useful to a practitioner to have a person in that capacity to uh, you know to help to, to outsource when needed. Like I said, um, and I would I would definitely look to your community and see if there is an opportunity to create a relationship with the local mosque um, where they, they might have existing counseling services. And you could even work with and pair up with uh, providers from the mosque or from the community center to, um, to help with clients when you get them or to just you know, consult on certain issues. That's absolutely something you should, I, I would recommend doing. Okay. Well, and it's kind of in the same vein, um, where should, where could um, me and my classmates go to find more information so we can kind of further our understanding? I know you have the, the website, the mentalhealthformuslims.com, yeah. um, but what other resources do you think would be viable for us? That's great. There's a lot of, um, I mean, you know, if we're, if we're talking specifically about learning about Islam, there's a great, uh, many, many different uh, websites or, or organizations. One that comes to mind that I personally know and have worked with, and I think they do a phenomenal job of explaining a lot of the core beliefs of Muslims and Islam in um, a way that Westerners totally get and understand because they that's what they do, is an organization called the Islamic Networks Group. And they're actually based here in California, in the South Bay. I worked with them for a long time, but they have a national uh, reach. They're in pretty much all the major cities. Um, they do, what they do is they provide trainings, actually, cultural competency trainings to all different institutions, hospitals, police stations, schools, universities, middle schools, like really everywhere, uh, corporations, 
that have called on them, they will come and they will actually do presentations on or trainings that will give you know people more uh, just general basic information about Islam, really bring them up to speed about a lot of the things that we talked about. And they also have great content on their website um, that you could like, there's an FAQ, most commonly asked questions about Islam. A lot of things that uh, people who have no idea about what Muslims believe in will uh, will get. And they, I mean, they, they work um, the office itself. There's non-Muslims that work there. So it's a very interfaith, uh, very um, just uh, American organization that is trying to make Islam more reachable or, you know, more uh, approachable for, for people who are outside the faith. So I think I can provide that in the chat. If you'd like uh, their website, I can, so you can look it up. But I think they have great resources on their website um, yeah that'd be great yeah well another thing just from um calling down and writing to the local Leavenworth uh center it there seems so open they I mean they're welcome within you know a few hours i got an email back and then a you know a phone call so it was amazing to see how open it is that we can just if we have questions or we just want to clarify or anything really Absolutely. And that's very much part of uh, the, the Muslim tradition. Muslims generally don't, um, we don't do like missionary work, for example, we don't go out and we don't, you know, proselytize that way. But we do invite and we're very open when people ask questions, like you could go to any mosque. And, you know, in terms of if, if your students or your fellow students were interested in observing, I'm sure they would arrange a meeting where you could, I mean, right now with COVID, it might be a little different, but post, uh, you know, when things open up or even online, they might have programs that are for the general community or for anybody to tune into. I'm sure they would be more than happy to give you access to that. And generally that's, that's the experience that a lot of people have. They're usually surprised like, oh, wow, I could just go in and talk to people and sit and watch the prayers and nobody says anything. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> because we're, we're, we have nothing to hide and we're very proud of our faith. And, you know, if people are interested. We're very honored by that. So we're happy to accommodate. And, and, and even like with uh, Munir and, and myself, uh, we were very happy to, you know, talk to you because it's, it's, it's actually really nice to have people who are interested in learning from sources instead of just turning on news media or going to random pla you know, places that speak for us, whereas we can speak for ourselves in these circumstances. So we're, we're really happy to do that. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um... I know you got to get going here in a couple of minutes, um, but I just want to say thank you. And do you have anything you would like to say to our, my classmates? Uh, well, first of all, again, I want to thank you, Eric, for coordinating this and all of you for being so sensitive. Um, I think really just having open conversations and not being, uh, I know that, you know, I'm very American. I mean, I don't know if you can pick up, I, I hope, uh, I mean, I didn't uh, explain, but my ba background, although I was born in Afghanistan, I was really raised here. I have no memories of Afghanistan. So I, I, I very much consider myself American. And I think I know that part of American culture is political correctness. And we're sometimes so worried about offending people and like, oh, I don't want to ask too many questions or, you know, it's religious, especially around beliefs, right? We don't want to, politics, beliefs, there's certain things we don't talk about openly in our society. But for Muslims, we actually really do welcome those questions. And I think you will find that experience, as we just said, across the board with Muslims, we're actually happy to answer questions. So feel like freer to do that. And I will make myself available for anybody who has follow-up questions to this interview. I can send you my email address. I do a lot of interfaith work. I speak publicly, nationally. So I'm very comfortable talking to people. Um, I have no problem answering questions, even if you think like that's a dumb question or should I even ask? Don't worry, um, you know, people about my hijab, about women, women's rights. I do entire presentations on women's rights in Islam. I talk about interfaith stuff. So I, I, there's really no topic that I would feel you know, a little intimidated by the answer. So I think uh, if you if, if they're interested, I can certainly make myself um, uh, provide my contact information for specific questions and also for resources uh, because our time is limited here. I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can make perhaps like a resource sheet with more resources for you and and even look to um, uh, registries that I'm familiar with to see if there's something more to your locality that that might help you in this regard. So I can do that um, as you know, after, after this offline. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Do you mind if I share your, I have your contact info, your email notes. Can I share oh, that? Yeah, the sure. You know what, if I can give you actually this email address, the other one is uh, for personal use, but the one that I'm posting right okay. there, that's more for general. And I, I just, it helps me to filter, you know, between family and, and business and all the other stuff that I get. So yeah, this second email address is, um, is uh, please feel free to share it with your students 
and I, and anything um, I have, I'm on a uh, line also, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. So people are on social media. My um, tag is the same and I do write a lot. So I have a lot of uh, talks that I give, but I also write a lot. So you can check out posts if you're interested, kind of seeing, you know, different, and I, I write on mental health advocacy. So that's like, perfect. I really appreciate this again. Um, sure. But I guess we'll wrap it up now since you got to get going here in one minute. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. In a couple of minutes, unless you had any final questions, I can, I can stay on for a couple of minutes. Um, I don't really have any left over. Uh, but so one quick one then, because all mm -hmm. of my classmates are female and you're talking about um, females yes. in, in Muslim community. Uh, I think a lot of times they're viewed as um, weak or maybe not as equal, but that's not yeah. true. And I was wondering if you can kind of Sure. Well, I hope I'm an example of that, that we're, we're definitely not shy, timid. And, you know, that's, I mean, those are just tropes. And, and unfortunately, the media has definitely uh, stereotyped us down to just that. But if you actually study Islam or talk to Muslim women, you will see that that couldn't be farther from the truth. We're very empowered because, you know, looking at the history of Islam and Muslims 1400 plus years ago, you'll see that a lot of the rights that Western women and women in other civilizations and societies have gone, have, have received just in the past maybe 100 years or so, Muslim women were given those rights, uh, you know, centuries ago, the right to vote, the right to inherit, the right to work, the right to own property. Um, a lot of those things were given to us. It was just part of our faith. So we've had that for centuries. So I think what we see, though, are is, is cultural. So a lot of, I mean, I come from a cultural, uh, like, I mean, culture like Afghanistan, right? where our introduction to Afghanistan happened after 9-11. It was put on the map. And the instant images you see are people wearing uh, that, you know, they call the, the, zoo, uh, the, the beekeepers, you know, blue, uh, the, the, the chador, right? Which is, uh, you know, an outfit that's traditional to the Afghan culture. And it actually predates even Islam. So people don't know that, that that was just something that even after, um, you know, the liberation and, and, and the Taliban were dismantled and all of, you know, the America and the troops and, and the Western troops entered, you will still go to many places in Afghanistan and the women still wear that. It's a cultural part of their identity. So it's not part of Islam, right? Um, but things like that, that I think are uh, really important for people to understand the difference between culture and the religion, because the religion itself is very um, liberating to women, you know, we, and I could give you, I mean, the presentations I do, that's exactly what I do. I go over the history. I talk about historical figures. I talk about all of the rights that are in, that are in the scripture from both the Quran and the Hadith, which are the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, where we're showing clear example and evidence of the fact that women have always had rights in Islam. And it's just a matter of systems, right? Patriarchy is real and it definitely is, um, you know, in every corner of the world. And when you see those systems in place, then sure, it's going to present as though, um, you know, uh, the women may not have certain rights, but not, that's not from a religious standpoint. And that's why you see Western Muslim women very much more vocal because they're not you know, under a lot of those systems, right? We can be more vocal here. So we, f you find Muslim women, I mean, we have, you know, uh, Rashida Tlaib, we have Ilhan Omar, they're in politics, you know, our first two Muslim women in, uh, in, in pol uh, political positions. So if we were really like the stereotypes in a lot of the Hollywood films and all of these other, you know, areas where we're just, we don't speak and we can't do anything, we can't move without our husband's permission, you would not see so many up and coming women who are very strong, very vocal, very outspoken, um, who drive, you know, who do things that, again, stereotypes may, may say otherwise, but we're, we're proof that that's just not simply true. And those are unfortunately just, you know, oppressive systems and government systems that are not in line with the faith. Um, but the presentation I have is actually, I think it would be great. I don't know if there would be an opportunity, but um, if it's something you want to talk about offline, maybe we can share some of those notes more, you know, with with the whole class.